ask the average third or fourth grader about dinosaurs and be amazed. It would actually surprise me if the average third or fourth grader didn't already have a favorite dinosaur. What was your favorite dinosaur in third grade, fourth grade? Tyrannosaurus rex, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and I had a bunch of neat ones back 100 years ago when I was in third or fourth grade. But it would probably surprise you even if you asked third and fourth graders here at the Lexington Church of Christ. Ask them this question. Say, did humans live with dinosaurs? Or word it however you want to. Did dinosaurs live with humans? You know, according to most textbooks, dinosaurs went extinct at least 60 million years ago. And man, whatever they want to consider man, didn't even show up till about 3 million years ago. There's two major problems with that, and both of them center around a four-letter word, T-I-M-E, time. We've been talking about Christian evidences this month, haven't we? And according to the Bible, can we come up with that much T-I-M-E? It's just not there, isn't it? So to assert that dinosaurs went extinct 60 whatever million years ago and man didn't even show up or evolve, however they would like to word it, until about 3 million years ago, the number one problem with that is time. There's not been that much time as we count time. You know, children are going to have an adjustment period when the truth of God's word is, is proclaimed, especially when compared to evolutionary ideas. Our children are going to have to make up their minds. My teacher and the papers they send home with me, and my children corrected me, by the way, which is not totally uncommon, but they were bringing home papers that said that be, would begin something like this millions of years ago in this period of time and that period of time. It didn't start in third grade. It was second grade. So it begins very early. My children go to Davidson County Schools. Okay? This is not like some other different unknown place. This is right here in this county. The teachers hand them papers that say millions of years ago and then dumb old Brock's up there saying it's just a few thousand, putting his finger on the scriptures, saying let's draw the conclusions from the Bible. The Bible teaches a few thousand. No way. It's several million. And they're in the gap. They're in the gap. The preacher and the word of God says one thing. The teacher and the public school system says something totally different. There's no way for both of them to be correct. What are we going to do? That's why we're going to preach the gospel. That's why we're going to stand up. That's why we're going to put our finger on the scripture this morning and ask and answer this question. Did humans and dinosaurs coexist? Four things we want to accomplish this morning. Here's number one. In the first place, let's talk about the evidence. What would it take to convince us that dinosaurs and humans coexisted? Well, Let's first consider the non-biblical evidence and believe it. There is non-biblical evidence to establish that dinosaurs and humans did coexist. To the honest seeker, there's quite an abundance of non-biblical evidence for the existence of dinosaurs. Most haven't taken the time to discover the truth for themselves. Do you know what they do? The teacher hands the paper, you read the paper, and that's just the truth. Well, I've never gone and actually thought about it beyond what the teacher hands me for the paper. Why not? Why not? Are we just going to be like little birds that whatever's put in front of us, we just eat it? We just accept it without even attempting to say, wait a minute, is there another explanation? Is there another alternative? Consider the fossil record. What do you mean? There is no legitimate reason to claim the devil put dinosaurs here. Or to think that fossils are the mere fabrications of men. They're real. They're here. They're legitimate. A couple of years ago, Logan and I went to the Greensboro Science Center and we saw, I think it's Sue, 
whatever it was, was a huge Tyrannosaurus Rex. Is that just something developed by men to deceive people? Well, no. They're real. They're here. They're fossils in the earth. But also, since we're sitting here and we live in a technologically advanced world, you and me might even want to do this while I'm preaching. Google ancient dinosaur carvings at your leisure. Whenever you want to. I don't care when you do it. You can do it right now. Whatever. How did human beings from thousands of years ago carve images of what we would recognize as dinosaurs into solid rock walls? You'll see this creature and say, oh, I can recognize that. That We've seen one of those. See this creature? Oh, I recognize that. I've seen one of those. And then there's a stegosaurus. So there's no doubt. That doesn't look like anything that I've ever seen with my human eyes, but I've seen pictures of that in books. Well, what'd they do? Just imagine that? Real, 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 imaginary. Real, 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 real. I don't think so. Explain that. How would you choose to explain that? Now, there's some non-biblical evidence, but we're Bible people. And we accept what the Bible teaches. So let's go to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 1, verses 24 and 25. Now, question. Was the universe and all things therein created in six literal 24-hour days? The answer to that is yes. That's what the Bible teaches. Then guess what? It is beyond question just from that principle that man and dinosaur lived together. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis 1, 24 and 25. And God said, observe this principle from Genesis 1, nothing happened till God said. It didn't just create itself. Everything, nothing happened Till God said. God said, then everything happened in harmony with what he said. That's the principle that we need to build our lives upon, isn't it? We don't do anything till we see what God says about it. We see what God says, then we do what God has said. God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature. How? After his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and, this is probably would encompass dinosaurs right here beast of the earth. How does the Bible express the idea of dinosaurs? Right here in the creation week. Beast of the earth, how? After his kind, and it was so. God said it happened, and it happened just as God said for it to happen. Verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and how did God feel about it? And God saw that it was good. Now, we also have to ask and answer this question. There the Bible implicitly teaches. You can see the next verse, what's created next? Man. Man is made in the image of God. Guess what? That's the same sixth day of creation. So land dinosaurs, as we would know them, they're created on the same day as man. So if we read later on in the Bible where God says, He made behemoth, which I made with thee, does that harmonize with the Genesis record? Yes. Now, let's don't get ahead of ourselves. Question, were there any dinosaurs on the ark? You ever thought about that? Were there any dinosaurs on the ark? Be turning with me to our scripture reading in the book of Job. Let's look at Job. We'll get in chapter 40, but we're actually going to back up to chapter 38 here for just a second. Job was what we would consider a post-Diluvian patriarch. Big words, right? Post after Diluvian has reference to the flood. So Job lived after the flood. He was a patriarch. Well, what gives us any idea that he practiced patriarchy? You don't have to get out of the first chapter. And Job was offering animal sacrifices for his children. That seems to have been a mark of the patriarchs. You can skip ahead to chapter 42. And after Job's ordeals, he lived 140 years. Well, how old was he? When his ordeals happened? How long did he live before they happened? Can't answer that. But based upon the fact that he lived 140 years after his ordeals, it is reasonable to put him in the general time frame of a person we know as Abram. Perhaps we know him better as Abraham. If anything, maybe just a, a touch before Abraham. So you're looking at about general time frame, 2000 B.C., perhaps a little, a shade or so before that. So Job is a post-Diluvian patriarch, okay? Job 1.6, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, 2.16, 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, 2.20
Job 42, verse 16. Job 1, 5, Job 1, 6, Job 42, 16. Now, back up with me to Job 38. The book of Job, we need to understand this, is a series of interrelated dialogue. The first two chapters kind of lay the, the setting, and then basically from there, really, to the end of the book, it's a matter of who is speaking. Job is three friends. They, they interrelate dialogue. Basically, a chapter is one speaker. Sometimes Job will speak two or three chapters. A young man shows up toward the end, but you can look at this on your own. But by chapter 38, the Lord himself begins to speak from the whirlwind. The idea of the Lord speaking here is to put essentially everyone in their place. No mere human knows what God knows. God sees everything beyond the veil, but he begins to relate things to these people that they could understand. Let me illustrate. Look at Job 38 and verse 39. Now this is the Lord speaking. Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion? Is that a real animal? Indeed it is. So this is something that they could relate to. Verse 41, same chapter. Who provideth for the raven? That's a real animal that they could relate to, correct? Chapter 39, verse 1. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats? That's a real animal, right? Something that they could relate to. Verse number 5 of Job 39. I'm going to take a little Christian liberty here. Who hath sent out the wild donkey? That's a real animal, something that they could relate to. Now look at verse 9. Blow your mind right here, right? Will the unicorn? Does that say unicorn? Is that what that says? Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Nah, it sure ain't what that says. Look at verse 10. Canst thou bind the, there it is again, unicorn. Now that's not so much a mistranslation as perhaps the idea would be a wild ox. Perhaps it would be something that is now extinct. Now the Bible's not teaching that there were unicorns. This is not a mythical creature. Look at the context. And we're going to look forward moving at some things after this. This is perhaps an animal that from our perspective is now extinct. I believe the New King James calls it a wild ox. It's a one-horned animal. Keep that in your mind. Look at verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks? Is that a real animal? New King James, I believe, says ostrich. The rest of the verse says, and feathers unto the ostrich, or the New King James says stork. Those are real animals, right? Something that post-Diluvian patriarchs would know and understand and be able to relate to. Now look at verse 19. Hast thou given the horse? We know what a horse is, right? We know that that's real. Verse 20. Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper or a locust? Those are real animals, right? Real insects, things that we know. Verse 26. Doth the hawk, is that a real animal? That's something that we know and, and can relate to. Verse 27, doth the eagle. See, all these animals are listed that Job is saying, can you totally understand all the minute details of these real animals? And the answer is no. No. We can understand that the animal is there. We can understand what goes on, but we don't know the ins and outs of that. Now look in Job chapter 40 and verse number 15. Keep in your mind, real animals Things that post-Diluvian patriarchs would have been able to see, understand, and know. Now, we asked the question beforehand, what animal is this behemoth? What animal is this behemoth? Job 40 and verse 15, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. Does that harmonize with the Genesis record? Yes, it does. He eateth grass, now pay attention to these, these are similes, these are comparisons. He eateth grass, this behemoth eats grass how? As an ox. It doesn't say he is an ox, he eats grass how? As, like an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. The underside apparently of this animal is exceedingly powerful. He moveth his tail like a cedar. An elephant is a pretty big, pretty strong animal. Would you say that that thing's tail moves like a cedar? Why? Well, it's, it's very unimpressive compared to the rest of the animal. Isn't it? What about a hippopotamus? That's a, that's a big, large, impressive animal. Have you ever noticed the tail of a hippopotamus? 
Does it move like a cedar? Why, it's just a little old nubby thing there, isn't it? So to say that this is an elephant or this is a hippopotamus, how does it move its tail like? Cedar trees are huge. And it moves its tail how? Like a cedar. So this animal has a huge tail. That doesn't qualify for an elephant. Sorry. That doesn't qualify for, an hip, for a hippopotamus, does it? Of the, the massiveness of those animals, their tails are unimpressive. I mean, I don't say that to disrespect it, but in comparison to the rest of the animal, what are those animals' tails? They're, they don't move like a cedar, do they? No, they do not. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. This is a massive creature. What would we describe? What would we say this is? The answer is this would fall under the category of a dinosaur. Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus. Some type of a huge plant-eating creature. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely, verse 20, the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. Verse 21, he lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fins. When you see those pictures of those big plant-eating dinosaurs, where do they put them? Where do they put them? Doesn't that what it looks like? They're kind of like in a swampy, marshy area. What is that? That's a dinosaur what we would call a dinosaur. Verse 22, the shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compassing him about. Look at verse 23, behold, he drinketh up a river. That's a huge animal. Can an elephant drink up a river? Hippopotamus? It's not going to be what those things are. This is a dinosaur. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through Snares. It should not be difficult for those who understand the truth about creation to, number one, accept, and number two, understand that humans and large dinosaurs coexisted. What was this animal? The Bible calls him behemoth. What would he fall? What, under what category would he fall? Beast of the earth. What would that be from what we're trying to dis discover and understand? That would be and have, would have been a dinosaur. Now, second. Let's talk in the second place about the explanations. Now, search all you like. But you're not going to find the word dinosaur in the Bible. So we ask three questions. Number one, what were they? Well, the word dinosaur is a man-made word, which means terrible lizard. I didn't, I didn't call it what it is. Other people made up that word. What does the word dinosaur mean? It means terrible lizard. A man named Richard Owen apparently originated the term in about 1841. Thus he and most other believed these creatures, like what we read in Job 40, believed them to be large lizards. Now most current scientists will concede that the majority, if not all dinosaurs, were cold-blooded reptiles. You know an interesting fact about reptiles? Even the ones that are on the planet right now is that they continue to grow their entire life. Now, didn't we see just a short time ago that men lived hundreds of years on this planet? Adam lived 930 years and he died. So if a man lived 900 plus years, how long would a lizard live? If a lizard lived 900 plus years, with sufficient food, how large could a 900-plus-year-old lizard become? I can answer that. Dinosaur-sized. Right? Is that reasonable? Well, yes, indeed it is. Question number two, where did they live? You understand that dinosaurs have been found on every continent upon the earth in just about every corner of the world's in, uh, world, and you know where they find them, they often find them in mass graves, what they consider dinosaur graveyards. You ever wonder why? I can answer that. What's the answer to that, preacher? Genesis flood. Washed them right down. And it washed them kind of in a pile, didn't it? Think about it. 
Water runs and it seeks its own level. Why is it that often that they find dinosaurs and they're all kind of grouped right there together? Genesis flood. That makes sense. Does that harmonize with science? Yes. Does that harmonize with the Bible? That's exactly what the Bible teaches. Question number three. What did dinosaurs eat? Well, some, like Tyrannosaurus rex. You ever tease your children? I hold my children's arms and say they got Tyrannosaurus rex arms. Can't reach anything. Some people are that way when it comes to giving up money. They can't reach all the way down there in their pocket to get any money, right? <laughs> anyway. Some, like Tyrannosaurus rex, were carnivores or meat eaters. The larger ones, like Behemoth, Brontosaurus, whatever you'd like for it to be called, were herbivores or plant eaters. Some were omnivores. That means they ate plant, they ate meat, whatever. To some degree, they'd get their teeth on, like oviraptor. Now, scientists can determine reasonable conclusions about dinosaurs. They say, okay, Tyrannosaurus rex, he seems to have been a meat eater. These big ones, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, Brachiosaurus, they seem to have been plant eaters based off their teeth. Oviraptor, he kind of could have eaten meat, he could have eaten plants. They, they determine all those things by looking at their teeth. Now, how could man, and this is where the dinosaur delusion begins to kick in, how could man have existed with such ferocious creatures? These big, humongous things with teeth that long. How could man have existed with such creatures? Well, the answer to that is the same way we do with everything else. How is it that people can sleep out in the jungle where there's hippopotamuses and elephants and everything else? Same way they did with anything else. There's still on this planet some pretty big, terrible creatures. How many of them have knocked on the door of your house? How, how many of them have crawled into your house? Well, let's see as to why. Back up to Genesis 1, and let's look at verses 26 to 28 this time and observe how God created man. Look at how God created man. Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us, notice that plurality in the Godhead, Make man in our image after our likeness and let them, man, have what? Dominion. God created us with dominion over the entire world. Notice this. Over the created world. Let them have dominion over what? The fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over how much? All the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That's how God created man in the beginning, isn't it? Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. How did God make them at the beginning? Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. Remember this? The male-female union, but it's more restricted than that, isn't it? It's husband-wife, lawful husband-wife. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish. The idea is fill, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now skip forward to Genesis chapter 9 and look at the language of the Bible in Genesis 9, 1 and 2. Observe when Noah and his family, as they get off the ark, listen, you would say there's only eight people in the whole world. So all these animals, there are a whole lot more animals on that ark than there were human beings in the world. Well, they'd be scared to death, wouldn't they? No, ma'am and no, sir. Look at Genesis 9, 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. What's implied in that? Their wives. They can do it by themselves. Verse 2. Now look carefully at this. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon how many? Every beast of the earth. That would have included the dinosaur. Even the big ones. Even the ones with teeth on them. Big sharp teeth. Guess what? They're inherently petrified of human beings. Why? That's the way God designed it, isn't it? The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand. What does it say? Are they delivered? I've only stepped on a snake once in my entire life. And if I told you where it was, you wouldn't like it. I'm going to refrain from telling you where I stepped on a snake. I wonder, I've wondered about this, and probably you have too. How many times did you run through the woods wide open, barefoot? Didn't look where you, how many times 
was there some type of a poisonous snake or some type of an animal with sharp teeth that was right within your presence and you had no idea. So we've, we've been ingrained to think that all these dinosaurs were just big and terrible and all they did is walk around and eat anything that moved. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, it teaches the opposite of that, that by and large these animals would have been just as afraid of us as everything else really is. Number three, let's talk quickly about the extinction. Why don't we live in the midst of humongous land lizards, terrible lizards? That's the meaning of the word dinosaur. In other words, what caused their mass extinction? We want to suggest two causes. Number one, the Genesis flood, and number two, humanity. Back up to Genesis 6 and observe verses 19 and 20. Somehow we've kind of got the idea in our mind that Noah and his family had to go out here and round up all these animals. That's false. God is the one who sent them to the ark. How do I know that? Genesis 6, 19 and 20. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou, now watch, bring into the ark. Now that's just the fact given. To keep them alive with thee, they shall be male and female. Pay attention to verse 20. Of fowls after their kind. The idea of kind is with the ability to reproduce. And of cattle after their kind. Of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee. He didn't have to go round them up. The Lord did that. The Lord sent what animals he wanted. At the age in life that he wanted them. And at the size of life he wanted them shall come unto thee to keep them alive. There's no indication that God sent full-grown animals. No indication. But what would have to be true is that God sent animals mature enough to reproduce. So you've got to say, well, there's some dinosaurs that were really big. How did they get a full-grown land-eating, uh, plant-eating dinosaur on the ark? There's no indication that it had to be a full-grown, fully extended dinosaur to be on that ark. It would have been mature enough to reproduce within a reasonable amount of time after getting off the ark. All the animals. Now some very reasonable conclusions about the Genesis flood, and you've heard these before. Number one would have been the water vapor canopy. We read about that in Genesis 1, 6 to 8. What are some results of that water vapor canopy? It would have made the earth on the whole have a more tropical climate, which would indicate lush, green, vitamin and mineral packed vegetation Worldwide, they have found dinosaurs and bully mammoths. In fact, on the continent we know as Antarctica, flash frozen. That is with the green grass in their mouths, undigested green grass in their bellies. So at one point in time, guess what? It would appear, based off science that we can examine, and the Bible that the entire earth would have been more like a tropical paradise, had a more tropical climate than what it has today. Now, since that's the case, the flood changed the overall climate in most locations on the earth, such as Antarctica, and the large dinosaur's food source was simply depleted. Those who are eating green grass in Antarctica after the flood, guess what? There ain't no green grass in Antarctica. It's a frozen tundra. There's number one. But listen carefully to this. In the 20th century, this is verifiable. Mankind hunted and killed to extinction what was known as the Barbary lion, the largest and heaviest of all the breeds of lions. Get in your mind the quintessential, picturesque version of a lion. That's what mankind hunted to extinction. In the 20th century, by the way. Now, mankind also eradicated the earth of what was known as the Caspian tiger probably sometime in the 1970s, but then they kept looking for them and finally declared them extinct by 2003. See in your mind what a tiger looks like. We hunted it to death. We eradicated the earth of the quintessential picturesque versions of the lion and the tiger. Now you think for just a second. Do you really think that men would not have coveted dinosaurs as they covet the ivory of elephants? the fur of lions and tigers and so forth? Oh, more than likely, yes. Therefore, land dinosaurs surviving the flood were probably all killed by men for one or more of several reasons. Number one, food. Imagine you knock down a several-ton dinosaur. What dinosaur meat tastes like? I don't know, but 
If people get hungry enough, you know what they'll do? They'll kill it and eat it. I'm not saying that's wrong. Number two, clothing. Get cold enough, things change. Would you wear about whatever you get your hands on? Probably so. Number three, protection. There may have been some rogue dinosaurs that tried to stomp through a village or eat this or that or the other. What do you think men are going to do? They're going to protect their wives and their children. But also, you cannot eliminate the idea of money. What will men do for money? What would mankind, especially those out who haven't been influenced by the word of God, what will men do for money? They'll do anything. They will do anything. Meaning, hey, if somebody says they'll pay me this exorbitant amount of money for dinosaur hide, you know what they'll do? They'll go find it, they'll track it, they'll kill it, they'll hide, they'll take the hide off that animal and give it to the highest bidder. We've already proven that with lions and tigers. Don't you understand? Beware, friends, of covetousness. The Bible condemns it. Colossians 3, 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So what happened to the dinosaurs? Who caused us? Genesis flood, mankind. Quickly, number four. What about the encouragement for our lives today? Given the evidence, explanations, extinction now, number four, the encouragement for our lives today. We want to suggest three quick, simple words. Number one, confidence. Don't you let these third and fourth grade children, don't you let them be confused. You let them have confidence in what they read in God's word and let them know that what they read in the Bible isn't almost right, it's exactly right. The Bible always harmonizes with true science. You know why that's the case? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly, through and through, furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Word number one is confidence. Word number two is confusion. We can know the truth about creation. Can we not? God has designed the Bible to be understood. We can understand the truth about creation. We can understand the truth about humans. We can understand the truth about dinosaurs. And we can understand the truth about eternity. Can't we? Think about John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, whether I speak of my own authority or of myself, on my own, just make it up as I go. If we'll examine God's word, we can say, is it millions and billions or is it thousands? Think about John 8, 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. God's words are in the Bible. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered why is it that so many people will not accept what the Bible teaches? Because it destroys their worldview. It destroys everything that they've believed to be the truth. And the simple thing is to do is dismiss the Bible. That's the simple thing, but that's not the honest thing to do. Word number two is confusion. Word number three is conviction. Isn't it about time we develop the courage to tell others the truth about creation, about the church, about salvation, about everything? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come. We're living it. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Healthy teaching says man and dinosaurs coexisted. They say it cannot have happened. When they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. What's a fable? Millions and billions of years ago, in a land before land, in a time before time, when terrible lizards ruled the earth, it never happened. Man was created on the same day as land dinosaurs, and man has had dominion since Adam. That's Bible. Or is that a fable? Because it does not harmonize with what the world teaches. It's beyond question that the Bible teaches humans and dinosaurs coexisted on earth. Will we accept the teaching of God's word and reject the false philosophies of uninspired men? Now those who desire to dwell with the Godhead in heaven 
will obey the New Testament conditions of pardon. You won't find what we must do to be saved in the book of Genesis, but you will find it in the book of Acts. But if Genesis is false, what does that say about Acts? But since Genesis is the truth, what does that say about the book of Acts? What must I do to be saved? Hear the gospel. Acts 18.8. Believe the gospel. Acts 16.31. Repent of sin. Acts 17.30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8.37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. You leave the world and the Lord adds you to his body. The church when we do those things. Acts 2.41. Acts 2.47. We die. The old man is dead and buried. We've been raised up to walk in newness of life and it is our duty to remain faithful to Christ and the gospel unto death. But even Christians from time to time stumble into sin. We go back to some of the same things that caused us to be lost in the first place. What must an erring child of God do to make things right? Acts 8.22 Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Wherever you are, make it right. Do it now. As together we stand, we sing a song of encouragement.